Welcome to Building Sustainability, the podcast that brings you interviews with designers, builders, makers, dreamers and doers, exploring the wide world of sustainability in the built environment by talking to wonderful people who are doing excellent things. I'm your host, Geoffrey Hart. This is the third and final episode of the coronavirus slash birthday special. This episode is with Claire O'Neill. Claire O'Neill is a director at a Greener Festival. A Greener Festival really works to promote uh, more sustainable events, looking at everything from uh, waste, uh, some recycling, uh, the travel, the things that are left at the end of a festival. Uh, and they run an award that events can self sign up to. And then they are assessed. Uh, this episode, we did have a small technical issue, uh, meaning that the sound quality is slightly degraded. Uh, luckily, not on Claire's end, and she does most of the talking. My end was a little bit crackly, but uh, luckily, I didn't have too much to say. Um, just before the episode, I think uh, currently it is really easy to schedule conversations with people and chat um, so if you do have suggestions as to who might be a good guest maybe that I haven't thought of um, I have got a stack of people who are sort of lined up and I'm gonna release them all sooner I think rather than hold on to them I think it's good that they're out there for you all to enjoy uh, potentially while you're stuck at home so yes keep the the comments coming keep the subscriptions coming if this is your first time listening then um yeah do subscribe and have a listen back uh i'll be back at the end just to do a quick roundup but other than that enjoy the episode So um, a Greener Festival is a not-for-profit organisation that's been going since around about 2006, 2007. Mm -hmm. um, and it started, uh, there were a number of factors that all kind of came together to make it come to fruition. Um, and from from my perspective, I'd been going to a lot of raves in the woods during my youth and, uh, <laughs> and these raves in the woods were really inspiring on many levels. Um, one of which was how the the people that went there were making sure that everything was cleaned up afterwards and were sorting out recycling and composting. And they had cafes where there was organic and fair trade food um, and they had solar powered sound systems and, and all of these like, just amazing way of doing things that I'd never even considered that hadn't crossed mm. my mind. And and because it was my kind of peer group, I was really inspired by that. But at the same time, I was uh, doing music industry management at um, Bucks Uni. And mm -hmm. I went to do um, work experience on major festivals. And when I went to the major festivals, I saw that it was a complete contrast to what I'd seen in the kind of counterculture raves, which was um, just big diesel generators, polystyrene, like and low quality food, no recycling, no composting, um, seemingly no real care for the space where it mm -hmm. was. And I thought, well, there's no way that a hippie ideal from the woodlands is going to translate to mega corporations putting on huge events. <laughs> it needs to be related to the business somehow. Yeah. Um, so I did my dissertation about festivals and the environment, um, asking, should UK music festivals implement environmentally friendly practices? Um, and that's obviously the answer was yes. <laughs> but um, my lecturer at the time, um, one of my lecturers is Ben Chalice, who is the legal counsel for Glastonbury. And okay. he's also legal counsel for Europe, the European Festival Association. And I'd uh, read in a magazine that they were going to do um, uh, an environmental initiative, but it hadn't quite um, got off the ground yet. 
I was gutted because it meant I didn't have anything to reference like from the music industry in my dissertation but um but then Ben suggested well why don't we now that you've finished the dissertation turn it into a website and a resource so my school uh, my university what do you call him? colleague <laughs> classmate uh, Luke Westbury he set up a website called agreenafestival.com and put the uh, findings of the research onto there and then festivals all around the world just started to get in touch to either ask for more information or to share with us what they'd been working on um, and then I think it was Ben had the idea why don't we make a, um, a checklist and we can do an award um, so we brought in a uh, Eileen McNamara, who is an environmental scientist and and started to work on from the research and her knowledge as an environmental scientist, what those questions could be. Mm -hmm. And it started off very simple. I think it was about 22 questions or something saying like, do you recycle? (laughs) You know, very, (laughs) very simple stuff. Um, And that was, I think the first year we did that was in 2007. Um, and then over the years, it's developed and evolved quite drastically because of um, getting to know all of the best practice and then more different expertise coming on board. Mm-hmm. Um, so now it's a really um, detailed assessment process, not only for festivals, but also um, we're working on one with arenas. Um, we've done different types of events as well, like conferences, um or um, like kind of multi-venue city events as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and in 2015, we started a training program because the, the awards had grown to such a level um, that it's being used for, for many different purposes, like in licensing, et cetera. And so we wanted to really upskill the people who were doing the assessments and also the um, um the locality so that we could have for instance the festival applies in Argentina then we've got someone in Argentina who can do it or in Australia so you, there's someone you in don't Australia. fly someone out no, no, the no. Yeah. exactly that's that's the aim and so we've got um a few different training programs now one is in classroom and that at the moment we only do in Europe um when we're allowed to get together again <laughs> <laughs> And um, and the other one is online. <clears throat> and the online one has been really, really useful with being able to, to reach a lot of people in, in other continents as well. Uh, so we've got quite a few in North America, South America. Um, Asia is still developing. So we started to do um, Wonder Fruit Festival there in Thailand. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the only one at the moment in Asia that we've worked with. So um, so that's it's kind of a bit chicken and egg as to when you get the assessors versus where, how much festivals come on board and which sure, one comes yeah. first, et cetera. But, um, but the training evolved. So um, a lot of the organizers also take the training. Um, so that, or sustainability managers from different events or people from from various departments within the events industry have been doing the training too. So it's quite um, it's quite a good exchange as well because you start to get perspectives from say a bar manager or um, the kind of sponsorship lead or a marketing person as well as the operations mm-hmm. people. So um, so it's quite a good kind of. Uh, like incubation hub of sorts. Nice, bringing together all of those minds. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Nice. And are, are people generally, when I say people, uh, sort of event organisers, are they generally uh, sort of looking to push the sustainability? Or is it um, a mixed bag? Yeah. I think that the prior to coronavirus, if I'm allowed to mention the C word, um, <laughs> The last 12 months, even the last six months, it was just an exponential increase in awareness and activity towards sustainability within the events industry. Um, and bearing in mind, we've done this since 2007. So and, uh, we've done the Green Events and Innovations Conference for 12 years as well. It was our 12th edition on March the 3rd. And we sold out well in advance and the the kind of, I guess, executive level of the people who were participating in that had gone to the top level, um, as well as the operational teams. And it's um, you have 
like, you know, the biggest events organizations such as Live Nation and AEG have all released their various different projects for sustainability, such as Green Nation or the One Earth program from AEG. Um, and then just with public, which I don't know which comes first. I mean, bearing in mind that organizations are made up of members of the public. So, <laughs> um, but the general awareness um, had really, really escalated a lot um, to the point that there was pressure coming from audiences to venues, for instance, um, or the choices seem to be being led more by, well, what are your sustainability actions? And people were asking more questions and accepting less. Um, so, for instance, with one of the very visible elements is with single-use plastics. Um, mm. There's a big uproar um, against single-use plastics, um, and which is it's always an interesting one because as festival organisers, there's so much discussion and so much focus on um, cups and single-use mm. cups, and um, and audiences may be asking, like, why are you using all of this single-use plastic? It's terrible. And then on the other hand, you look at the campsite at the end and there's, like, <laughs> thousands of tents left behind, which is um, the, uh, the AIF, I think, released a video, um, the Association for Independent Festivals, which said that one tent equates to about 8,000 straws. Um, so you can see how much plastic has been left behind each time someone decides not to take their stuff home. So, um, but this is something that we'd been campaigning on for a while, and and a lot of organisers from all around Europe were coming together related to campsite waste. Hmm. Um, and then that's that's kind of on the the plastics and the materials side. But then the awareness around climate change is something that had really escalated as well. So. Um, there's a big move internationally and on a government level as well as across business for making things um, like net zero carbon or reducing mm -hmm. carbon emissions <clears throat> or indeed offsetting them as well. Um, and it's it's hard to say whether the campaigns that have been happening are one of the things that escalated that awareness to such a degree because um, we had – for instance, Greta or Extinction Rebellion um, and, Dif and David Attenborough, um, whose voices just went to epic scales. So is that what was leading the awareness or is the fact that we were becoming more aware that gave those even more amplification? Because mm. <laughs> it's not like they were the first people to say the same. Um, and then uh, other elements that could have really pushed that awareness just the fact that the the things the problems of plastic pollution materials usage waste um climate change were becoming a lot more visible um mm -hmm. so you know for instance all of the fires that have been happening the plastics in the oceans is actually clear that it's a real thing rather than some distant um idea <clears throat> Also, the IPCC, the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, had said, I think that at the time that they spoke, they said it was 12 years to avoid catastrophic climate change, which now I think would be 10 years from now, or is it nine years? I forget the dates now, but it's a, a human scale. <laughs> so you can imagine it. Ah, uh, oh, right, okay. So I think that it became very... Um, tangible the impacts of climate change and the impacts of the way that we've been um the way that our systems are set up basically mm -hmm. um, there's also been in recent years the the push towards the circular economy so in that respect policy was really leading business investment um mm -hmm. not to get too dry about the matter <laughs> but um so rather than the kind of make, use, dispose, um, trying to find how whatever we're creating stays in that system so we've got a closed loop. So once it's mm -hmm. been used, there's a plan for those materials afterwards, ideally that feed the same system. Um, so, so that's been something that festivals have been looking at, such as uh, there's one festival in particular that's really championed that concept called um, Digital Festival in Amsterdam, which is DGTL. Okay. 
Um, and so they were looking at how they could make every single material that came into their festival something that stayed in the loop. Um, and it's not it's not yet perfected, but it's something that they've used that kind of um, concept as a real driving force in the way that they make do their planning. Sure. What sort of things were they doing? Uh, they had something called the Circular Food Court, for instance. And there they teamed up with an organization who collect waste food, um, like food that would have been rejected either from the supermarkets or from agriculture. So by taking waste food um, or would be waste food for their ingredients, they've already saved carbon rather than producing it. Um, so that was the first part of it. And then they had something called... Um, the chef lineup working with them and uh, that's where instead of having various different food vendors <clears throat> they had um, different chefs and they'd provide the ingredients which could be anything depending on what was going to waste and then those chefs need to make the menu based upon the food rather than buying the food based upon the menu. So it's ready steady cook for festivals? <laughs> Basically yeah. <laughs> um and then they made sure that the, um, the the serveware that it was being served on, so all the plates and cutlery, etc., was able to be composted. Um, and that's something that's often a challenge as well, which we could talk about in a bit, maybe if we talk about waste industry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I like but waste. It, oh, me too. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they, uh, they so they made sure that all of the serveware was compostable as well as the food. And then they have one little area where all of the food waste would come to. So rather than having bins kind of scattered everywhere, they had this central hub where the food waste um, and compostable serveware would go, where they'd have it for people uh, staffing it as well to make sure that it's the right food that goes in there. And then they had a lot of um, really good looking uh, kind of infographics around there about food waste and the impacts on land use and carbon, etc. So then they would take the, the compostable material to be composted and then that compost could be used again in the agriculture that's creating the food to be used um, on the festival. So a nice closed loop in that respect. <laughs> Fantastic, yeah. Um, the, the food um, serveware, that's been quite an interesting one and it's something it's something that expands beyond festivals because we started using a lot of biodegradable serveware in coffee shops for instance um, what we found is that the majority of the compostable serveware wasn't actually being composted but more likely incinerated so getting into the, the wrong bin is that um not necessarily um even when it was separated out so if you had uh let's say you have a, a bin bag that's filled with all compostable serveware that's got a bit of food waste on it which is which would normally be the case really because people throw away their empty plates or empty cups etc um if it's mostly for many for many industrial facilities for processing waste such as anaerobic digesters um, they would have uh, allow a 20 percent contamination rate within the organic waste in order to be able to process it to a good enough quality um, the um, serveware was being treated as contaminant so if more of that bag if 20 if more than 20 percent of that bag was the serveware even though it's compostable it would very likely be rejected from the compost facility or the anaerobic digester which would mean that it would just go to incinerator um, mm. and then there's uh, there are facilities that can take it but generally you need to have made that plan in advance and let them know exactly what's coming when in what quantities and um, and which type of biodegradable material it is because it has to be at a certain temperature and because it's a dry material it needs to be at the right levels with the wet organics as well um so it's um it's something that um something that we've been working quite hard on was the that kind of education or or system so that when you're planning what materials to bring in to an event, and the same works for shops and businesses as well, you've made sure that whoever you're 
waste contractor or facility is can actually handle that material. Um, and if they can't, then you need to reassess and think, well, what material do we need? Um, and if they can handle it, under what conditions do they need it? So do you need to make um, certain seg segregations within the event uh, to make sure that it's separated properly and is a clean stream? Um, or are there other materials you need to avoid? Uh, so, for example, um, have you seen the PLA cups or the um, biodegradable plastics that just look like plastic? I don't think so, no. So it looks. Oh, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it just looks like plastic, but it's made usually from cornstarch or other kind of bio materials instead of fossil fuels. Um, so the, the problem with that from that was discovered way back uh, was that if it gets into the plastics recycling, then it contaminates the plastics recycling. Or if plastic gets into the PLA uh, waste stream, then that contaminates the PLA waste stream. So um, so if you were to use biodegradable plastics, then really you need to make sure you're not using, say, PET or polypropylene or kind of traditional fossil fuel based plastics as well. So it's all or nothing then. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So it's um, it's quite complicated. There's not always a one size fits all. But, um, but I think the key always comes down to that chain of communication as well. Yeah, that's. It seems like you need to be, uh, or a, an event organizer needs to be looking at the the very end, and then working backwards from that. Yeah. Uh, which I th think is probably the opposite way to how everyone's worked, you know, so far, uh, or maybe you know, up until recently. Mm. But yeah, waste was definitely a a thing that you got rid of, and then you didn't think of again yeah exactly exactly it's the way that um we've been trying to reframe the thinking on it I suppose is rather than thinking about um materials that you purchase um and then using it and then waste is to look at it all as resources um and to go okay well how can we keep these resources at a high value um rather than creating something that actually costs us money because generally waste costs money because you need to dispose of it and you're losing the value. So it's about how can you retain value in everything that you have? Um, and that's that then works. That must extrapolate onto a global level, because if you're maintaining value, then everything's staying cushy. <laughs> Whereas if you're depleting it, it all goes to shit, <laughs> basically. <laughs> Although talking of shit, um, that's another very valuable resource it is. Um, that we should as waste yeah <laughs> um, it's possibly one of my favorite subjects actually on um, on festivals <laughs> and uh, we when we look at the um the toilet systems mm -hmm. um that's an area where i feel like we've gone so far in um in waste management as in uh, like uh physical materials like plastics papers cans etc that people have can see that there's different um, materials there that have different values where you can separate them and look after them in different streams in order to keep that value um, rather than just bunching it all up together and throwing it to landfill or not really knowing where it goes or caring. Mm -hmm. Whereas at the moment with our um, liquid wastes, we tend to just bunch everything together and then take it all to one place and not really think about where it's going kind of the same way that we used to treat other materials in the 80s and 90s. So I think that we're probably going to start to take the same approach more and more with liquid wastes as we have done with solid wastes. Mm -hmm. So if you can uh, separate out grey water from urine, from faeces, then you can make much more valuable resources from those, such as compost or clean water or um, gathering phosphorus, for instance. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, I think that that's an area where once things come back online, there's a lot of opportunities for doing much better than um, than what we do at the moment. Yeah, um, I, I remember, well, where was I? It was Boomtown Festival. I was playing on a church stage there once and uh just i was surprised because it's it's quite a big uh yeah big rave uh essentially uh and i was surprised to see that 
pretty much I think all of the toilets were were composting or certainly collecting the waste. Oh, yeah, they've done some really great work at Boomtown. Actually, they're they're very very passionate about trying to do everything that they can. Um, it's a real challenge because of the nature of the event is such a high capacity and so many small mm. production elements that build up into one massive, you know, amazing yeah. wonderland, <laughs> basically. It's, a, it's quite a wild audience as well. It's pretty hard to, um, to achieve everything that they're aiming to, but the organisers go above and beyond um, to try and make it as sustainable as possible. For instance, investing into that sheer volume of compost toilets. And the benefit of the compost toilets, if it's, if it's used properly, is that you harness the nutrients that would otherwise be lost Generally, they don't use any water either and, um, and very low electricity. And depending on the type that you bring in, a lot of the compost toilets are um, flat packed on delivery. So you can bring a lot more toilets in than if you bring in the pre-built ones. Um, yeah, and also it's a, it's a misconception sometimes that to have a compost toilet, you need to dig a pit in the ground because there's that's not the case. A lot of them can be hired just like other temporary toilets where everything gets taken away off site afterwards. Excellent use of uh, uh, wheelie bins as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like how the, the my design brain really likes how they've they've found a really uh, useful. Uh, you know, a vessel which can carry a lot of stuff, but also has wheels, so it's portable. Yeah. Uh, you know, exactly. a, a closable lid, uh, <laughs> and then design the toilets around that. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Again, working back, working from the bottom up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we we've touched a little bit on on sort of waste uh, and plastics. Um, how about things like uh, sort of carbon carbon emissions uh, of, mm. of events? So uh, the biggest impact of most events that have got a large audience or certainly who are um, outside of cities is the audience travel. Um, mm -hmm. And then as far as what's in the direct control of the organisers, um, one of the most obvious is the um, actual, actual use of energy on site. Um, but to look at the transport, there's the, the audience, the artists and the production. So there's been a lot of initiatives over the years to try and get more audiences traveling by public transport, which is the optimum for reducing the impacts or to encourage lift share, for instance. Mm -hmm. But um, it's been quite interesting to see. I mean, obviously not this year, but <laughs> let's not talk about that. Um, <laughs> We can talk about that, and we will. <laughs> but um, it's been interesting to see that the travel habits haven't really changed much over the years. Um, mm -hmm. So it was first investigated in maybe 2008, um, and now people look at it every year. Um, it's generally 50%, 60% of audiences are still traveling by car. Um it's it's really tough and something that's a real bugbear of mine actually is uh, and again we'll see how the landscape changes in these new unprecedented times um but it's a lot cheaper when looking at for instance northern europe uh, to fly to places than it is to take mm -hmm. the train and that's even the case within the uk as well that if you're going a certain distance it would be cheaper to fly often than to take the train so there's no correlation at the moment economically between carbon emissions and cost. Um, and that's something that really needs to be addressed. Um, I mean, we, we were looking at mechanisms that could do within the industry, but really it's something that needs to happen at a, a government level and, and an international government level because um, there are subsidies and there are taxes that influence how expensive or cheap things are. And at the mm -hmm. moment, they're making high carbon um, industries, I guess, cheaper and then low carbon options more expensive. And realistically, like although 
people like to think that they make choices based on ethics and morals. It's very difficult to do that. And probably about 20% of the, the ethics and morals get in there <laughs> when you look at the kind of broad spectrum. Whereas things like cost are a real significant influence on what decisions we make um, out of necessity, a very yeah. kind of upfront um, tangible necessity is the cost of things so if we're going to make things like train travel more um, accessible reliable and cheaper than flying then there's obviously going to be much more people using ground transport instead of flights for for the Mm -hmm. short distances Um, I'm wondering whether with the potential bailouts of airlines um, through governments, this could be an opportunity to to really change uh, some of those mechanisms. Um, I mean, we don't know at what point everything will come back online again, but I think that there's definitely this is the moment where we've had a shock in the system to to change the system a little bit, <laughs> give it a bit of a reshuffle, yeah. take the pack of cards around a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think I said this uh, to someone else recently, but uh, I was told the other day that uh, one of the big kind of uh, outbreaks of, of virus or disease uh, was the downfall of feudalism. So, uh, you know, we we can hope for uh, what this one might, uh, might cause. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, in, in kind of in behavioural psychology as well, like my... Um, colleague Teresa Moore she's been doing her PhD on um, kind of behavioral change and communication using campsite waste at festivals as or, or campsites um, having things left behind at festivals as an, a kind of case study um, and one of the points that's that's often brought up in behavioral change is that one of the key things that can cause change is a big shock um, and like a shock to the system. Normally, it's talking about on an individual level, but now we've got it on a global level, like a sudden oof <laughs> in the road. So, what better time to like upload some new software for uh, for new ways of thinking and new ways of doing things? And the beauty of this shock, in a way, and, I, and not to belittle it at all, because obviously it's harrowing and awful in many respects. Um, but from a global community perspective, there isn't. Um, It isn't kind of humans against humans, which a lot of the other global shocks have been, Mm -hmm. where there's different sides. Whereas in this case, it's like actually we're all kind of on a level playing field in a way, or we could be if we rejig some of our systems. So um, so I think there are opportunities amongst the the difficulties for sure. Um, So so what sort of – I'm just sort of thinking in my head as you were talking about – people traveling to festivals and i was thinking how if the bus stop was like right in the middle of the campsite with priority entry Mm. that i wonder wonder if that would encourage people because i know certainly you know a lot of people take a lot of things to festivals and so having a car and having you know all of that sort of space is is a sort of premium for them that they Mm. wouldn't necessarily give up so i was thinking about the the ways that that maybe you could make public transport more uh, more enticing yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean a few festivals have worked on that that even Glastonbury they built because uh, their trains were up to capacity at one point and so they built a um, a coach park pretty much within the festival so if you took the coach then you get dropped off into a really optimum place so that you've got a lot less distance to go and then you can get priority camping and things like that um, and a lot of other festivals have tried the same or they've done um, combined tickets so that the um, the coach ticket is combined with the festival ticket. Um, if you're going to do that, you need to make sure that um, you're looking at where the audience are coming from, because it's not just the drop off at the other end, but the pickup needs to be convenient for people to get mm-hmm. to. Um, there was an interesting, um, oh, actually just on that about making the coach travel more more interesting, there was uh, different events had started to organise entertainment on the buses or if it was a <laughs> yeah, so it becomes a part of the festival 
or um, if you're traveling a long distance and there's certain stops on the way, um, I forget which festival it was now or if it was a coach company that did it, but they um, had entertainment at the kind of stops. So when everybody gets off for their refreshments, or whatever, there's a band playing or there's something going on that's part of the festival. And then they will get back on and carry on the journey. Brilliant. So doing things like that to make like, because it's all about the journey. It's not about the destination. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, uh, the other thing that, um, that I'd seen with um, the coach travel was uh, into, the, into the Great Wide Open is a festival um, in Vleeland. And it's quite a small festival, but they're really, um, really proactive and innovative in the things that they do to make the event as sustainable as possible. And they look a lot. Uh, there's an organization called Lab Vleeland that, that works with Into the Great Wide Open. And they look a lot into how they can minimize their carbon emissions, for instance. Um, I could talk a bit about them in relation to their fuels, actually. But the the one example I was thinking of there with coaches, they teamed up with a local delivery company, I think, where people could have their luggage picked up from their houses <laughs> and taken to the festival um, so that they could just travel like without having any baggage with them. Brilliant. Um, and I thought that was a really interesting idea. And then you just like kind of put it back on the coach at the end and it gets delivered back to your house. So that means that there's like a smaller number of bigger vehicles bringing the luggage in. Um, and yet everybody else is able to travel kind of by uh, bike, whatever it's in mm. the Netherlands, <laughs> and by boat. But um, yeah, I mean, it was a small scale and a test, but it's quite an interesting concept and idea. Um, I think one of the other um, good ideas that I think could help with the campsite waste as well um, is to actually just have pre-pitched camping instead of everybody bringing their own stuff. Because mm -hmm. um, one of the big problems is the, the cheap and um, non-durable campsite equipment that gets sold uh, largely by the supermarkets or by some of the big campsite brands they'll sell a festival package where you get like tent, sleeping bag, mat, chair, two chairs, all for a really low price and really low quality. Mm. So people will bring them along, maybe even on their way to the festival and then just leave it there. Um, so if you just say, okay, no one needs to bring their own camping equipment, we'll just provide it for you. Um, there are organizations doing that, like Camp Light or Fest Event, for instance. Mm -hmm. Um, and they can even collect up their tents that have been previously <laughs> used and use them again the next year, provided they're not crumpled in a heap. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, reducing how much stuff people need to bring. If all you need to bring is your fancy dress, then, then you should be able to manage on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> That's, yeah, excellent ways. I, I noticed at, uh, I only went to one festival last year that was Green Man. And they had huge banks of, of pre-pitched tents, all very neatly laid out, which was uh, slightly, slightly jarring on the eye, actually, when you're used to seeing the, the hubbub of uh, sort of festival yeah. uh, tent, tent mess. Uh, yeah, but yeah. I mean, that's, that's one of the important balances as well, because the point of the festivals is supposed to be a very liberating experience. So you don't want it to be too regimented and uh, structured. Um, but another idea which I think could work quite well is where people um, almost book their space in advance. So one of the big issues if you're going to camp at a festival is that your group of mates all want to camp together. Um, and it can be a bit of um, a ball ache, so to speak, <laughs> when you're like trying to hold the space for that last person that's turning up really late. Mm -hmm. It's like, dad! <laughs> so if you had like... Um, areas that are allocated to different groups um then you kind of you know who is in that area so if everyone leaves their stuff behind afterwards mm. you know like hang on it was this group of people that left all their stuff send it back to their house for them afterwards yes accountability <laughs> accountability exactly but also um another thing that we tried with uh, arcadia field at glastonbury um, when we kind of we, we took a little bit of ownership of the campsite that was next to the Arcadia field to see if we could do some um, 
some trials of how we could get people to take their stuff home. So we tried to make um, community spaces that had campfires and put pathways between all of the tents and then had um, using the love your tent kind of idea. We'd, um, with permission, spray the Arcadia logo onto people's tents and stuff like that, just to try and give it a bit more um, of a um, feel like a community and a sense of ownership over that space of the people that were there. Because if you feel like it's a nice space and you're responsible of it and you're a participant in that area, then maybe you're less likely to um, not care for it afterwards. But there was still, at the end, there's still people leaving stuff behind. Mm. Um, although, I mean, that like most people would take it away, but there are always some left behind. Um, whereas this year, they or this year, last year, um, Glastonbury really put loads of resource into trying to encourage people to not leave their tents behind. And it was a sunny year, which was great. But I've seen sunny years in the past as well, and it's not been as great as it was this time. So they had um, huge teams of people um, on the last day, as well as throughout the festival, going to talk to people and say, come on, guys, let's like take your stuff home. Um, and so I think that that coupled with um, also hopefully the increased awareness about the amount of materials that we're all using and wasteful behavior and single use, etc. cetera. Um, it, it ended up being far less tents left behind than, than ever before at Glastonbury, which was amazing to see. Great. <clears throat> it was really amazing to see. It's, um, it's still not a solved problem, but it's definitely chipping away bit by bit. So. Well, maybe that coupled with, um, do you know uh, Billy Goats and Raincoats? Oh, yeah, yeah, who make the um, the jackets out of tents. Yes. Yeah, yes. that's brilliant. <laughs> I really like that. Yeah. Um, yes. So um, with we talked a little bit about uh, reusable cups earlier. Yeah. I wanted to ask, because I've read some things about, uh, mostly about plastic bags, uh, sort of shopping bags, where they've said that the the sort of thicker bags that you have to pay for, they have a lot more plastic in and people are still sort of using them in the same way that they use the old uh, thin ones. So like using them as a bin bag, for example, and then chucking them away. And actually maybe the amount of plastic used is uh, sort of comparable, if not more. Uh, mm. With with the reusable plastic cups, I, I know most of my friends have a stack of uh different festival cups in their in their cupboards and they're yeah they're being reused um yeah i wondered if you had any any sort of thoughts on or, or knowledge on how how sort of uh successful that sort of campaign is yeah absolutely i mean it's um it's a really important point because the plus the hard cups as i call them they're um usually at probably five times more plastic than the single use cups <clears throat> which already means that you'd need to use it five times to be the same impact as the the smaller cup. Um, mm -hmm. So we've actually done a lot of very detailed studies into um, into the impacts of it in different materials, etc. And uh, generally, we found for a reusable cup to have an environmental benefit, it needs to be used five to fifteen times. Um, in order to be better than the best kind of single use option. Mm -hmm. um, that's from a carbon impact perspective, whereas from a plastic pollution perspective, um, there's, there's a much higher risk of plastic pollution from the single use just because of the way that it's used. But if we're going to start to use the, the hard cup systems um, within the events industry, then there needs to be really... Um, and there are, but um, across the board, there needs to be really robust systems for making sure that those cups come back and get used again, ideally within the industry, to be honest, because um, when, we do, when we do our studies, we say if a cup leaves the event perimeter, we class that as a loss. So even if a person is using that again and again in their own home, We've kind of got no way of knowing that and we don't know how that gets disposed of in the end. 
Whereas mm. if it's coming back into the event um, to be reused on another event, then that means they're not having to get them all manufactured again for the next event. So long as they leave the event perimeter and get taken away, then that event needs to produce more plastic again the next time mm. and again leaves the perimeter. So ultimately, it's more plastic being manufactured and taken out into um, the environment, even that even if that's via someone's household over time. Um, so the ideal is to have the reusables, but then to capture them all, whether that's through a deposit system or simply um, some events practically can't at the moment deal with giving back, say, 40,000 deposits when everyone leaves at the same time at the end of a gig. It just doesn't work. Um, mm. So then you can have a levy system, which is where you might pay an extra couple of pounds or a pound or whatever on your foot or a, do a dollar or a euro, <laughs> depending on where you are, a yen. <laughs> and, um, and then when the person leaves, you have kind of um, like a, a place where the cups can go, like ideally in tubes. So it all gets pre-stacked, which saves on all of the efforts for um, operationally for restacking them again later. And some events, uh, such as I know that the British, uh, what they call the Brit Awards, did this. Um, and I think, oh, which they did, the O2 Arena, maybe? Maybe not. Don't, don't quote me on that. Um, some venues <laughs> have <laughs> been um, giving um, the levy to charity. So they have these charity bins and they say, put your cups in here and then your deposit or your levy that you've paid to us, we will then give it to this charity that might be something to do with water or um, or cleaning oceans or whatever it might be. Um, so I think that it's right to consider that producing more plastic and then still using it as you'd use a smaller single use item is not a good idea. <laughs> Capture it, reuse it as many times as possible. So it's an ongoing uh, ongoing system then to, to refine and improve these. Uh... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's organisations that have, have got really great systems. I mean, there's Stack Cup, for instance, in London, who provide a lot of the arenas and, um, and festivals here, um, and Green Goblet in Bristol as well. Um, and Stack Cup have got their own industrial washing place in, um, in Twickenham. I think they've got a second one now as well. And then they've got um, the manufacturing happens in the north of England. And um, and then they when they collect all the cups up and they're no longer able to be used, they then turn them into other items. But it's downgraded items such as like, a, I think like crates and things like that. Um, but they've got really good systems in place and they're always looking at how to improve it. And then within the festivals as well, it's the um, or within the venues or whatever it may be, the way to manage them is being really refined as well so how can you optimize so that there's not longer queues at the bar so that the health and safety is satisfied where there's not a situation of a dirty cup touching a nozzle because you only ever use a clean cup and step them all away um the, the deposit systems and payment systems are all being refined a lot as well and um, so i think it's pretty advanced and um one of the difficulties at the moment for some venues is the storage capacity because if you've got to have five times as many cups for a venue because you're always given a clean one every time and they're five times the size as single use ones it's like where are you physically going to put them um i do have an idea though and um and i've just been i think it's a really good business idea and i've been saying it out loud because i don't think i'm ever gonna do it myself <laughs> okay um, and that, Pitch it to the, to, the, to the people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that is that we've got a lot of kind of obsolete buildings within our cities um, because a lot of our retail, for instance, is going online and we've got too much of a surplus of, of buildings that are only used for retail or for commerce. Um, whereas we've got some very real needs um, on an industrial level to support some of the other businesses that are there. So, for example, if you've got, say, 200 venues in a city centre, um, and at the moment there's a problem with cleaning and capacity of keeping cups, then why not have um, one or two of the buildings in the city centres are the cup cleaning and storage buildings? 
And so it's like a collection and delivery from a local building where they deliver out all of the cups to all of the venues and then collect them all back up again, clean them, deliver them. A bit like the milkman used to do <laughs> you know, yeah. on a much larger scale. Um, so I think repurposing some of our empty, um, obsolete spaces as uh, as cup storage cleaning places would be a very good idea. Yeah, I agree. I think um, what you were saying again about uh, pre-pitched tents, one of the, the sort of issues that that brings is that you know, all those tents need to be stored by the, the organisation rather than by the individual. And therefore, yeah, that's another thing that needs a lot of space. Mm, exactly. But it's um, if we're going to start um, looking at different models, then it's looking at how you can turn some of those services into other branches of the business. So at the moment, most of those pre-pitched tents, for example, are something that's provided by a third party contractor. So if they've got a business model whereby that service of um, pitching, cleaning, collecting, storing is something that's an economically viable part because it saves money on the um, the organisers having to dispose of all of that waste and clean it up, plus the audience would pay for that service instead of paying for their own kit that they have to get from the supermarket, whatever, on the way in then it's just readjusting the the business model and where the economics flows so that you've got services that deliver the what's needed rather than it all being about products. And the same could be done by, for instance, those who are profiting at the moment from the really cheap, crappy um, materials. If they were to switch their business model so that instead of profiting from the cheap, crappy materials that they sell and then leaving it on someone else's shoulder to dispose of them, if they instead provided a service where they have quality materials and then they are being paid to be the ones who are pitching, cleaning, storing, then um, then they still they still have money being made, and that's um and that is important to look at it in that respect as well because like I was saying before with the flights versus the trains, if you lose money or if it costs more, then it's going to be very difficult for it to be taken up on mass. So you need to look at how you just switch the business models around. And it's the same with the cup cleaning, for instance. That would be a business. Mm. You know, that would be something that's that's a paid for service. And you just have to look at the full kind of budgets and where the where the costs are. And also look at where the externalized costs are as well. Because the reason that a lot of things that are damaging the environment or damaging society are cheap is because the cost is being borne onto the environment or it's being borne onto other members of society um, who are being abused along the, the supply chain. So if you stop externalising the costs and look at it factually, <laughs> then uh, then we could make a utopian new world. <laughs> it's all possible. <laughs> yes. <laughs> bit by bit. Um, so who... In the UK, who's the best festival in Ooh. terms in terms of a greener festival? Your your uh, awards in terms of a greener festival. Well, this year, or I should say, in twenty nineteen, the winner was. Um, and now, bear in mind, the Greener Festival Awards are a certification, so many people, many festivals win each year. Um, but the one that scored the highest in the UK in twenty nineteen was the Green Gathering. Ah, and the green, yeah, yeah, it's kind of um, partly unsurprisingly, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of the ethos that they're built on, and um, and that's the same, um, largely the same organization that was the big green gathering in the past, and and the they are one of the inspirations even for, for a green festival starting in the first place. So, when we were seeing all of these great organizations like the Green Futures at Glastonbury, big green gathering, um. A lot of the protest organisations as well. There's Kingston Green Fair, um, and then the European events like Boom Festival, um, etc. Uh, but yeah, so they they were the winners this year, and they also won um, the the International AGF Award for um, Greener Power okay. because they use 100% um, renewable energy, and they work on. It's uh, they're like okay, this is how much renewable energy we have. And therefore, what can we use within that? So it's the same kind of idea as you spoke about earlier, of looking at what you've 
like kind of the end game and then building back <laughs> mm. from there in a way. Um, and they've been real pioneers in that from the start. Uh, they also have um, Compost John, who's been composting their food waste on site for years. <laughs> I'm trying to get him to do a talk, actually. Maybe um, you should have a chat with him as well. Yeah. Um, but he, um, he sorts out all of the organic waste on site and does a fine job while he's at it. They, um, they also, I think that one of the, the great things with the Green Gathering as well is they use their event in order to really boost and promote everything about sustainability. It's kind of in their core. It's not just something that's kind of an afterthought or, or part of the, the operations, etc. It's really um, they use their voices to, to really try and inspire and to give a platform to people that are doing great things as well. Mm-hmm. Um, other events in the UK that got the Outstanding Award this year as well, there's um, Cambridge Folk Festival. Um, and they've been going for a long time, uh, but they do really great work there too. They were working with the local water <clears throat> facilities to provide water bars, like on tap as well. Oh, so nice. everyone was using their refills. And, and then they go into real detail and look at every little element, such as um, you know, there's, there's usually big refrigerated trucks for bars. Um, but they don't need to be switched on the whole time. So um, I think that they need a certain, a longer amount of time at the beginning of the event. And then overnight, they don't need to be running. But often at many events, they do just keep, like, stay running to keep mm-hmm. them cool. Um, but the sustainability manager there, Liz Warwick, goes around and makes sure that everything's switched off, like, just at the right time and isn't allowed to switch on until it's absolutely needed. Um, so she does great work. And I think that the Cambridge... Um, council as well have been really supportive in trying to make it as sustainable as possible um they even have helped with with increasing the infrastructure for instance to connect to the main sewage so to reduce the amount of trucks that need to be um shipping things around so um so yeah that's another great event in the uk as well nice um and what what you've sort of spoken of some of the the innovations uh, that those those guys have done uh, what are you? Know, are there any other sort of standout? Yeah, standout innovations for sustainability mm. that we've seen on festivals in recent years. Um, again, like I was saying before, my favourite subjects are around um, sewage and water. <laughs> so uh, they, they always get my attention more than anything else. And um, there's at Boom Festival, they've always had not always, but for a long time, they've had this uh, water system where the water is fed from the top of the hill. So it doesn't use any um, pumps, electric pumps, in order to distribute the water to most of the caterers and showers as it goes down. And then at the very bottom of the hill, they have a um, a kind of wastewater processing area so the water flows down into a chamber where it then gets pumped through a fountain. And then the water, as it goes through the fountain, flows through these um, other kind of concrete chambers. It flows one direction and then it goes down to the next level and flows the other direction. And in there, there's a lot of different plants and rocks and microbes that eat the pathogens in the water as it flows through and it gets aerated. So it essentially does what nature's doing. Mm-hmm. And over the years, um, this has become a really beautiful, because they've painted it all in lovely artwork, but it's also become an ecosystem. So it's a wastewater treatment area that's beautiful and an ecosystem, (laughs) which is a very rare thing to imagine. Yeah. And it has, um, so they they helped with uh, the frog population, started to come back and live around there. Um, and it flows through all these different chambers and then the water goes into another kind of holding lake, I guess, where they add more microbes and um, and plants to eat the, the remainder of the pathogens. Um, and then it's good to go back into the environment. Um, also, um, Paradise City Festival in Belgium, they've done a lot of work in relation to the water as well. And they worked with an organization called EcoZ. And they've got this trailer that can go around to different events as well. And they're collecting up the water, for instance, from the showers. The grey water goes into this trailer. And then they have a similar system where it's with plants, rocks, microbes. Again, a replication of what nature does to clean water. 
Um, and then they're able to pump that water directly back into the river or the lake because it's it's clean enough to do that. This year, they also had um, another organisation on site. Uh, whose name I've forgotten. I'm actually going to look at what their name is. Oh, no, I remembered. I remembered. Um, called Bozak. And they were taking the water from EcoZ and making it fit as drinking water. Um, so they got various solar panels and they were using UV filters. Um, but they are developing that mainly for application in, in areas where they have no drinking water. Um, and that's what I love about most of these water cleaning systems is that they're developing them in our formerly affluent <laughs> um, environments of uh, festivals and then taking them into places where there's no access to clean water, for instance. Um, same with the toilets as well. So there's um, an amazing organisation called Luwatt. And, um, and Lou Watt, uh, there's a um, Virginia Gardner is an engineer who, who created it uh, as one of the founders. And they've, it's quite bizarre when you go in there for the first time, actually, because they use uh, the same kind of vacuum technology like in um, aeroplanes. But they essentially shrink wrap everything that goes into the toilet. <laughs> okay. So it's like this little like bag that goes and it shrink wraps everything on its way in, which is just it's very interesting in itself. It's quite a um, it's quite a luxury experience going into a Lou Watt toilet. You know, they're used on very high end events and um, but also within festivals and um, and the beauty of of their organisation, they they create electricity from all of the waste that that they collect. Um, but they also provide toilets then in places where they don't have access to toilets. So helping with sanitation in other countries um, and invest in a lot of their pro profits and, and the fact that they're in funded by working with the events industry or a part of it is through the events industry. And that's the same for many different um, amazing technologies, whether it's in relation to power, water, sanitation, they can use the events industry as a way to really develop those systems and then take them and use them in disaster zones or places where they don't have that infrastructure yet. Uh, it, it just occurred to me that while you were talking that it, it's a very unique, um, the, the events and especially festivals, it's a very unique world where you essentially build a town with all of its eco, you know, its structure and its ecosystems uh, and you know it can be improved on year on year at a much sort of faster rate than you know an existing town with all its uh with all its infrastructure that's that's all sort of set and so you must see some quite rapid improvements absolutely yeah and more recently there's been more attention from um from town planners and uh, in the Netherlands, certainly the Ministry of Infrastructure and Environment are very interested in using festivals as living labs, because like you say, to change, for instance, the sewage network of a city would be a huge investment, um, absolutely huge. And so you'd have to be very sure of the certainties before you invest that kind of money. Um, whereas you can do a lot of testing um, within reason in festivals <laughs> because you're bringing you're often bringing in all of this temporary infrastructure um, and you've got large crowds of people and then you take it all back out again so there's definitely a lot of opportunity for uh, research and development when we have these kind of temporary cities built um, with behavior as well and like how people react to different things it's it's quite an interesting um space and opportunity there's a there's a trials at the moment that were happening or I don't know if trials is the right word for it but there's hydrogen fuel cells mm -hmm. are starting to to come back on the market a little bit um that's another example of where there's some crossover between usage within festivals but also for instance in refugee camps um the hydrogen fuel cells have been quite an interesting one because I think it was about 10 years ago they started to get used on festivals already. Um, but they're very expensive. Um, and also the um, 
the hydrogen, the process of getting the hydrogen is very energy intensive. So, um, and often that energy was coming from fossil fuel sources. So, so what well, is this economically um, and even um, environmentally the best option? Um, whereas now there's more research happening in investments from certainly from Europe um, to look at is the hydrogen accessible via renewable energy? Is it accessible via byproducts of other industries? Um, and therefore, is it possible to look at taking hydrogen fuel cells um, as uh, a temporary power solution within generators? But also, um, there's a lot of attention with it for vehicles as well. Mm. Obviously, it's a very volatile material. So, um, so that's a consideration as well. But, um, but yeah, I think that, again, it's those opportunities in very commercial applications to be able to do that that testing so that you can use it where it's really needed as well excellent i did i did want to say that uh i so i used to build a secret garden party uh festival years ago and i for maybe two or three years in a row i would get there in april and i'd build until i think july uh and i (laughs) i remember talking to you uh about whether you would doing any work with Super Garden Party. And I think you just sort of chuckled and said, don't they just set fire to one of their stages at the end? <laughs> yes, Aww. yes, they do. Um, but yeah, that, that really, um, I, I really loved that job because I was creating a new weird and wonderful thing every day. And, you know, there was no, no two days that were the same. Uh, and then uh, I hated it because everything we were doing was for, a four-day party and then you know some of it got used again quite a lot of it got burnt uh yes so um it's nice very nice to hear that uh our festivals are, are getting better and, and it's not all like <laughs> like like my my days at seeing your party it's not just flash and burn no. <laughs> Yeah, um, one of my um, favourite examples of of how to work with sponsors um, is from Secret Garden Party, and that's where um, you see you've got the the image of a sponsor um, providing loads of single use stuff and making the um, say the beer offering really homogenous at the event, and then you end up with essentially branded litter everywhere. Um, whereas Secret Garden Party were always really really good at how they would engage any partners on the festival and they had this uh for instance this amazing like it looked like something from Tim Burton uh this Cavoisier bar <laughs> where there's no branding on it at all and it was just creating something that was um so so good and and added a lot more for the people who were there um and yet still gave something really good for the the sponsor who were coming in um, I think it was like a pedal powered cocktail making machine or something like yeah. that. So um gotta give it to Secret Garden Party when they existed. They had some of the greatest creative ideas. Yes, very much so. It was I mean, it was a, a very fun, fun place to be. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> and they also had the great um I mean, I don't know all the ins and outs of it, but they stopped at, at ten years. They were like, Okay, we're stopping now. Whereas um yeah, it's, it takes a lot to do that when you're actually still really successful and selling out all the time to just mm-hmm. go, this is what it's course now. <laughs> We're doing something else. It's too big. Stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, well, before lockdown, uh, bands like uh, Coldplay and Massive Attack were the big the big ones. Uh, or, yeah, the, the big bands shouting about it. Uh, they were saying that they're not going to go on tours until a more sustainable option is is found. Um, do you think that the the lockdown and and our sort of move on to digital possibilities is is going to help? Uh, is it going to change it? Uh, could festivals be replaced with uh, virtual reality headsets? You know, a, a device that pours beer down your back. Uh, to, to to give you the, the full <laughs> festival experience, uh, oh, it suddenly seems so much more realistic <laughs> and feasible than it did before. <laughs> Maybe it is the future. <laughs> yeah, how do you do? You see things developing. 
Um, it's a really interesting question. It's a really interesting thing to to ponder, and um, and it's something that, so prior to the pandemic, Coldplay had said that they weren't going to tour till there was a more sustainable option. Massive Attack were researching what the impact of their tour was, um, and then they were planning their European tour to be by train instead of by flights. Um, a lot of different artists were starting to be able to speak out because I think that um, there's a real fear of a backlash about, um, well, how dare you talk about the environment when you travel all around the world? Um, whereas actually, I think that that's a, a real pity because um, because there is a great platform of artists. And I think that the more that we can talk about not only the solutions, but also the obstacles and the problems that make it not possible to do um, the the really beautiful things that get done without damaging the environment. Um, now we're in a really difficult situation because, I mean, not no emissions are being made <laughs> from yeah. touring. We're doing very however, well at that now. <laughs> exactly. Um, however, obviously, in order for um, for a lot of initiatives to happen or in order to make investments into um, alternatives um, there needs to be um, the economy needs to be working as well so it can't just there isn't kind of a good and evil you know it is necessary to have a functioning economy um, in order for us to be able to to do things well I think um, so it's quite hard because the industry will have taken a massive blow economically as a result of no activity. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, I think that it does raise some opportunities. And to answer your question about whether we'd see um, concerts or festivals now being digital instead of physical, I don't think that there will be a complete switch like that because I don't know about you, but I am gagging to go and see some people <laughs> in real mm -hmm. life. Although, actually, my I think my social life has been slightly improved by this lockdown. Yeah, that's I've, been, I've been to five different gigs and hung out with my friends all the time. And I guess you've not spent so much money either, so no? <laughs> we don't no. need to make money after all. There's the revolution. Um <laughs> But I think that there will still be an appetite and a desire and a need for coming together because that's a basic human thing that we've always done, you know, from when we were around campfires, you know, just that that coming together, I think, is really important. Um, however, I think that the delving into the digital possibilities now, um, there will be perhaps a, a kind of hybrid version where there's a lot more digital activity around the events um, potentially some of the programming within the event will be coming in by stream or digitally, whereas previously, I mean, so I'm, I organised a conference and I never wanted to stream anything in. I'm like, no, I do not want that headache. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> because actually now it probably will be very normal to do that um, and we'll have tested all the systems and know that it's going to work and find the benefits and then additional opportunities and, and reaching people that you couldn't reach before as well. Um, I think that something that may happen um, by necessity is looking at what the local um, possibilities and, lo and national possibilities are for touring routes initially. Um, and that might be a, a place where the streaming and the local kind of come in together because if, for example, um, promoters across five different countries collaborate and go, okay, well, we've got these artists in our territory. Um, you've got those artists in your territory. Why don't we do a joint event together where the local artists are coming physically to the event? It's perhaps smaller but then we stream between the events. So you've got our artists streamed into your event. We've got your artists streamed into our event. So you kind of make it a, a kind of global, local um, mm -hmm. thing, which is one of the concepts between, behind sustainability anyway, is to have kind of the um, global thinking on a local level. Um, so I think there could be more of that potentially. Um other things that could come from it, I think that one of the great benefits is just the psychological impact on um, realising that there's something bigger than business as usual. 
because we were talking about climate change and sustainability for decades, um, but there was no way that anything was big enough or scary enough to stop business as usual. It's just like that's unimaginable. It doesn't mm -hmm. exist. We're the rulers of the world and we're going to keep doing what we're doing no matter what. Whereas now we can see that that's not true um, and we can be stopped. It can stop. It does stop very quickly, very easily. So having understood that, um, just to even realize that as a concept that seemed unimaginable previously, now we can imagine something bigger than business as usual. So we can imagine something different to business as usual. Um, so I think that's a real opportunity on a, like in, across every industry and with every individual. Um, coming back to the music and the events industry, um, I think it's also one of the difficulties we have in implementing any sustainability plans or strategies or initiatives is having the time when we're embroiled in actually delivering the shows. So if we can take that kind of stepped back opportunity to go, OK, well, what were the economic drivers and structures previously? Um, we need to get them back up and running, obviously, in order to have an industry, um, in order for people to still be able to pay their bills and they feed their kids. <laughs> so um, how can we potentially restructure it so that previously we had uh, economics doing very, very well, environment doing not so well, um, and looking globally, which this is a global industry, um, socially not doing so well as far as perhaps equality and mental health and the global south and how money is distributed. Um, but socially, as far as connections between people, it's outstanding. So how can you then, now that the economy is on its knees, the environment's doing great, um, the social is kind of a you know, for as far as us getting together. Well, actually, you said you've seen more people than ever. So let's say the social is doing just fine. <laughs> I mean, um, in my, my very small bubble. <laughs> <laughs> but um, how can we then go, okay, so before the environment was on its knees, the economy was booming. Now the economy's on its knees, the environment is doing okay. How can we bring that back into a, a position of stasis where you've got sustainability as it's truly meant to be, which is across the three pillars with environment, social and economic so can we redistribute and restructure the way that the money moves in order to um, actually care for and account for the environment and society as well um, it's a tall order but I think it can be done <laughs> I, I was sort of lucky that loads of people are sat at home with nothing to do they can, yeah exactly uh, start, start well, putting these uh, thoughts into practice yeah, I'm definitely contributing because I've already done two whole jigsaws. <laughs> <laughs> how, how many pieces? Uh, both a thousand each. All right, that, that's acceptable, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, the world will be fine. <laughs> um, but something that's... Uh, that's crossed my mind I've, I've said to a couple of people is that I felt before like we were just running and running and running non-stop it's like you know you're kind of running along in a direction thinking I'm not sure this is the right way <laughs> but no one could stop because we were all going at such speed and um and so now that we've got the chance to stop maybe we can reassess a bit and and just saunter in a different direction. <laughs> <laughs> Stop, look around. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, you're here too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much to Claire for having that conversation with me. It was a really great one. I had such a nice time i've known claire for for a long time now uh but we don't really get to see each other very often uh, i think we worked out that the last time we actually saw each other was on a climate march in when would that have been maybe around five or six years ago so really nice to reconnect and just to see all the great work that she's doing I I wanted to say that uh, I felt bad. I feel like I've given uh, Secret Garden Party a, a bad rep 
uh, in my comments there. It was a, a truly fantastic uh, festival and it did have really, really good intentions. One of the really good, well thought out uh, plans they had was uh, they had a woodland stage, um, which I actually built the, the Treehouse DJ booth in. There you go, if you've ever danced to the, the Secret Garden garden party uh in the tree house area that was me um but yes sorry that's i'm just picking myself up there uh the, the point was that uh when it rained that whole area got super wet and, and muddy and their solution was to plant a whole ring of willow trees around the outside and willow trees are really really thirsty trees they can suck up a lot of uh a lot of moisture out of the ground. Uh, and so the idea being that it would be a natural way of controlling the, the moisture there. Um, so yeah, really forward thinking, smart stuff. I, I I love you all, the Secret Garden Party lot. I didn't. <laughs> I hope you're not offended. Um, I also wanted to say, I put, put a link to most of the things uh, that... Uh, we've talked about you could maybe consider becoming a, a green a greener festival assessor uh, a really great thing even if you're just doing it to learn about sustainability and events yeah really really good thing to do i'll put a link up to that and i wanted to say i i had a thought i was thinking about how uh where we've moved entertainment into the uh the world of zoom and to live streams and and things like that and thinking about the way that that might change and i actually remember for my birthday maybe how long ago was that quite a few years ago genesis the band uh were doing a tour and i went to see their gig being streamed from i think it was rome it's italy certainly uh in my local cinema uh, and it was great, and I, I think it was maybe under attended, uh, but I think you know, going going to a place, your local place, that's got a really booming sound system, uh, and enjoying a gig, yeah, you know, it's not not quite the same, but it was certainly um, well, it was certainly better than flying to to Italy, for example. Um, so yeah, interesting that Genesis were doing that uh, probably 15 years ago, I think. Could it really be that long? Oh, I think it might have been. Crikey, that's made me feel a little bit old. Um, so good. That's it from me. Um, stay healthy, stay indoors. Uh, hopefully you're listening to this uh, from the other side of the lockdown and everything is great and and the world is now a better place um let's hope all the best i'll see you next time